That was amazing. So amazing to be able to see. And also, in addition to that, you survived the blizzard of 2023. <laughs> I mean, can you, you made it to church after a blizzard, you survived, that's just remarkable. Uh, we did, as a family, about four years outside of Chicago. We can tell you what a blizzard was like. That was awesome yesterday, but um, yeah, maybe not quite a blizzard. Can you believe this? We're six weeks away from Easter. Like, it's almost March. I'm still having trouble putting down it's 2023, much less that it's going to now be March of 2023. Um, and we're six weeks away from Easter, and every week as we approach Easter, we're taking a different statement that Jesus made. He said seven different times in the Gospel of John, I am, Pastor Woody started last week, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And we're going to take the uh, seven of those statements as we approach Easter, one a week, and just talk about that. We're going to do something quite different right now to start. Would you do this? Stand up with me. I know you just sat down, but stand up with me. Out loud, we're going to read scripture. I, I've got from John chapter eight, a selection, just the words of Jesus. I took out any time it said like, and Jesus said, and he said. I took out all of that just for out loud to read uh, the words of Jesus with your best, strongest, boldest voice of declaration. You ready? First in John eight, verse 12, here's what Jesus said. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In John chapter 8, verse 23, Jesus said this, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. And then in verse 24, he said, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he you will indeed die in your sins. Uh, chapter eight, verse 29. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Uh, also, verse 30. Even as he spoke these words, people believed in him. Just as he spoke it, many believed in him. Look, look at verse 31. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I'm going too fast, sorry. Verse 36. So, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And then lastly, in verse 58. Very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. And listen, at this, verse 59, at this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. God, speak to us now. Give us ears to hear your voice. Give us eyes spiritually to see, uh, to have understanding, to know and to hear your voice. Move as only you can move. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. You can take a seat. So that's reading started in John chapter 8, verse 12. Before chapter 12, here's what happens. Imagine this with me. We'll, we'll try to make it uh, to be a little bit more like right now. Imagine with me right now, we're here and we're in a moment. We're gathered to hear the Bible taught. And all of a sudden, in the back doors, we hear this commotion so loud, so disruptive, we all turn to look to the back. What in the world is going on? What we find is there is a group of men barging into a worship service with this woman. They're sort of pushing her forward, dragging her along, pushing her to the front like there's a spotlight on her. And Jesus is in that moment in the middle of teaching and they completely interrupt what Jesus says. And they say, teacher, this woman has been caught in the very act of adultery. The law of Moses in the Old Testament says stone her with rocks, just so we're clear, with rocks. Stone her right now. She deserves death. What are you going to do about it, Jesus? In this moment, there's a pause. Now, we're told they're trying to trick Jesus. They're trying to trap him. And Jesus is going to have to respond. And what does he do? And so... 
Instead of just directly, immediately answer their question, here's what Jesus does. He kneels down and he begins to just write on the ground. Now, there's all kinds of questions in this moment. Like, did they really catch her in the act? Did they give her time to change? It seems like this is a moment of humiliation. They're wanting to shame her. Where's the man, by the way? Like, there's a double standard like there often is going on. And Jesus refuses to enter into this immediately. And so he's just writing. And then he sort of looks up and he says, whoever is without sin, you pick up the first stone. He takes the spotlight that they have shining on her and he shines it on them and says, hey, if you don't have any sin in your life at all, then you pick up the first stone. And then he goes back to doodling in the dirt. One by one, they start to walk out of the room. We're, we're told from the oldest to the youngest, one by one, they just sort of fade out. And Jesus looks up at her and says, where, where are they at? Does no one condemn you? And she says, no, no, nobody condemns me. And he says, so I don't condemn you either. Go, but sin no more. Leave your life of sin. She, she had a radical encounter with Jesus. Now, here's what's crazy. It seems, if we're not careful, that it's just her and Jesus one-on-one, -on -one, but I think there's still a crowd of people around because Jesus is teaching a lesson, and they're interrupted as these guys barge through the door. And so as soon as sort of the woman leaves and she goes on her way, I guess Jesus is still left with his crowd, and the first thing, the immediate thing that he says is found in John 8, 12, and it just simply tells us in Scripture, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This becomes a teachable moment. And Jesus wants them to understand in this moment, I'm the light of the world. This is a significant statement. And if we are to understand what he means by this, it's going to have impact on our life. It's going to have impact on decisions we make. It's going to have impact on what we value. It's going to have impact on our relationships. See, Jesus did not say, I am a light in the world. He says, I'm the light of the world. This is a claim that, that has exclusivity to it. it it's a claim that, that narrows the focus. I'm the light of the world. He did not say, I'm the light of your life, or you're the light of my life, or those love songs from the 80s, you light up my life. He says, I'm the light of the world, the whole entire world. This is a grand claim. And he didn't say, I am a light for religious people, or good people, or deserving people. He said, I am a light, and whoever, whoever will follow me can have this in their life, can have darkness turned into light, and can come after me. Let me break down the words in that verse real quick, just, just to give us a context that'll help us for the rest of the time. First, Jesus says, whoever follows me. Now, following me is not a one-time decision that you made way back when. Following me is not, I go to church on Christmas and Easter and once in a while in between. Follow me is not, my grandma was a Christian. Follow me is active. It's a present day kind of in relationship. It means you're, you're committing to someone. Not just deciding way back when, but your life has been devoted to someone. Not perfectly, but, but in a committed way. He says, if you follow me, you'll walk. You'll walk in the light. Walk is not just simply like literally taking steps. In, in those days, this meant the way you live your life, the decisions you make. How do you decide to spend your money? How do you conduct yourself? What do you think about? What do you do in your free time? What do you watch on uh, Netflix? Like this is your walk. It's all of these daily decisions, how you think, how you feel, what you value. And he says, you'll walk in the light, not in the dark. Now, even that needs a little bit of clarification. When we hear dark, 
we think maybe wickedness or evil, which that's very true. Often in scripture, it's that. But also darkness is unawareness or unbelief throughout scripture. And Jesus is marking a change in the whole story of scripture when he comes on the scene. All before the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, Jesus isn't fully revealed. Now everything from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John comes into a different context. It comes into the light with Jesus. He's shining a light. Now you read the Old Testament with Jesus in mind, and you're like, oh, Oh, that's what that was about. You read the prophets with Jesus in mind, you're like, that's who they were prophesying. You read Revelation with Jesus in mind, you're like, oh, he's the center of the whole story. And so he's bringing into light reality and truth. And he says, if we're going to follow him, the promise is we can have the light of life, meaning all of us want to have the best life possible. Hashtag blessed. All of us want to live our best life now. Like we want that. And Jesus says, I want you to have your best life. I want you to have the fullness of life. And he says, and it comes in me. It comes through me. And he wants us to have that life. And even the word have in this passage is fascinating to me. Because it it, it can mean to hold, to have, that kind of thing. But it's also in the sense of wearing. Like you're, you're putting it on. You're wearing it. You have it at your disposal. It's practical. It's applicable. It's like glasses They're no good unless I wear them. So um, before the pandemic ever started, I had absolutely no need of glasses. I could see amazingly. And then Zoom happened. Zoom destroyed my eyesight somehow. So now in my house at any given time, whenever I'm at the office, whatever, I have two pair of glasses. So now here's the deal. In order to have my glasses to use, I actually have to find them. Now that I'm three years into having glasses, I realize finding them is part of the battle. Anybody, any four eyes like me, you're like, if I could just find them, then I could use them. So I often have to do a search. Where did I leave my glasses? Half the time it's on my neck or whatever like that. Where did I find my glasses? I have to find them, locate them. But then I have to put them on or it's all still blurry. You know what I mean? It doesn't do any good to just have them. I have to put them on and use them. And then I see a little bit more clearly. I love what C.S. Lewis writes in The Weight of Glory about this idea. He says, I believe in Christianity. You could even just say Jesus. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it. It's beautiful but because by it I see everything else. Picture this, like the darkness before the dawn, and you can't see anything, it's just dark, and then you begin to see the sun rise, and you're like, I see the sun, I see the sun, but then because of the sun, you see everything else, because it's illuminated. And yes, there's an element of desperation of saying, we want to see Jesus and we want to know Jesus absolutely 100%. And as we get to know him, we then begin to see the rest of life in a different way. If you were with us when we started the year, we were in a series in the book of Genesis, the first three chapters, and we talked about worldview and these important questions to ask. Origin, where did we come from? Questions like, Uh, identity. Who am I? Questions of meaning, like what's my purpose in life? Questions of morality, like how do I live? Questions of destiny, like what happens when we die? And the Bible addresses these questions. And the dilemma is we try to make sense of our world on our own, if we're on our own, by our senses. So what we taste and see and smell and hear, we're trying to make sense of that. Or we're trying to make sense of our world by our experiences. What's happened to us in the past? How were we raised? Our experiences begin to inform how we make sense of the world. Now it gets a little bit more even, even, even troublesome. We try to make sense of the world by our feelings. How are you feeling? Just do whatever you feel like doing. Or we try to make sense of our world by our desires. What do I desire? What do I want? And what we're told in scripture is we must be careful of living those ways only. We've got to have our desires, our feelings, be sure that they're rooted in scripture and grounded. We've got to have even our experiences and our senses grounded in the reality. 
But even beyond all that, there's another way that we can live, and it's by revelation and how God reveals to us this is what's true. So that's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about what Jesus reveals about himself, what Jesus reveals about our world, and what Jesus reveals about us in John 8. All I'm doing is John 8, basically. One chapter. First of all, what Jesus reveals about himself. It's like he's shining the light on himself. And he reveals his authority. And he gets into a little bit of trouble about this. Number one, he reveals his relationship to God the Father. He's, and he says, and we'll get this in just a moment, he says, I am, I am. He says, I do nothing on my own. He reveals his relationship to the religious history of the people he's talking to. He says, I am the light of the world. And they would have immediately thought back to Exodus and the crossing through the wilderness and the wandering. And God, his very presence was a cloud by day that lit the way and a fire by night. And they knew where to go because they followed the light step by step by step. So when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, they immediately are thinking, oh, he's talking about Old Testament stuff. In this very passage, he's talking about before Abraham was, I am. And they're like, Abraham was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. You're not even 50 years old. I mean, he's barely 30 years old. What are you talking about? And Jesus is like, before Abraham, I was. I am. I is. Bad, bad grammar, but you know what I mean. Moses. He's like, I, I'm, I'm here in the authority and the spirit of Moses. I'm beyond Moses. I'm God in human form. His relationship to the world. He's not just my personal savior or your personal savior. He's the savior of the world, the Old Testament. He was a light to the Gentiles, to the ends of the earth, over time and eternity. Revelation chapter 21 says when we get to heaven, there will be no need for the sun or the moon to light the way because the glory of God will light the way. It doesn't say there's no sun. It says there's no need for it because the glory of the Lord will be a light. In Exodus chapter three, this is what I want us to grab hold of just real quick. This is what all the religious leaders knew Jesus was talking about when he said these statements. Exodus three, God is speaking to Moses. This is such a significant passage in the Old Testament for the Jewish people. God has invited Moses to follow him and to trust him and to go with him. And Moses is basically like, who are you, God? I don't know who you are and who am I, God? In Exodus three fourteen, here's what God says. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Here you're like, well, that really clears it up. He's like, I am who I am. This is what you are saying to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. It's this God of being, this God of reality. Verse 15, God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. And he's pointing through the reality of the truth of these early pages of scripture. And so when Jesus steps on the scene and he says, I am, no wonder they picked up rocks and were ready to kill him because they were like, he's claiming to be God. And Jesus is like, yes, the authority, the exclusivity, the audacity, if it's not true, so that's why we can't just say, well, Jesus is a really good teacher. Just don't believe everything he said. You can't say that. You have to say he either is who he says he is or it's all a fraud. And I'm here to say for hundreds and thousands of years, it's been proven he is who he says he is. And the resurrection, we'll celebrate that in six weeks, is the greatest evidence of all time. He is who he says he is. And he reveals this and, and, and identifies with the, I'm sorry, I'm getting all tangled up in my mic cord. I gotta fix this real quick. Okay, that's much better. He's picking up on this idea of authority. John chapter one, to start this very gospel that we're reading, there's this magnificent and yet audacious statement again. In John one, we're told, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That sounds just like Genesis chapter one on purpose. Verse two, he was with God in the beginning and through him all things were made 
And without him, nothing was made that has been made. Check this out. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The, darkness, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It's this beautiful picture of the dawning of a new day with the birth of Jesus, the, the coming of Jesus to this earth, the dawning of a new day to see, but also to see everything by as well. Jesus reveals all this about himself. This is who I am. Secondly, what does Jesus reveal about the world? He's a light shining on the world. Number one, he, he reveals darkness is around us. This world is a dark place. Does anybody need to be convinced of that? But also, the darkness is in us. Ephesians 5, 8 says, you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. You're darkness when we're apart from Jesus. Jesus says, deception is the world's native tongue or native language. In John 8, you read, you are of your father, the devil, a liar, and he only speaks lies. And so we've got to fight against the lies. <clears throat> And then also Jesus reveals about the world. Death in our world is a result of sin. Now, a few weeks ago in Genesis chapter three, we talked about this, that in the turning of Adam and Eve away from God, death entered, sin entered our story. And, and death is not just physical death, it's also emotional, spiritual, relational death begins to come into our picture. The, the, the death of our world, it wasn't supposed to be this way. There wasn't supposed to be death and sorrow and crying, but that's a result of sin. And apart from Jesus, we're living life in the dark. We're running and walking in the dark. And that's a dangerous thing to do in the dark. When I was like 18 or so, I was at a, a camp, a, a youth camp, church camp. And we were playing capture the flag. Anybody played capture the flag before? It's like hide and go seek but a lot of running and trying to get a flag from some other team. Now, a couple things. Uh, me and my group of friends, we were very competitive, so a little bit of arrogance there, trying to win. And number two, there were pretty girls in the group, and we were trying to impress them. So you do dumb things with girls around. So I'm running to try to get to the other side to get the flag in the dark through the woods, which I never actually recommend doing that. I'm running in the dark through the woods and never really understand that there's a telephone pole right beside of a tree. And I definitely don't understand there's a guide wire holding the telephone pole. And it didn't have one of those yellow shiny things that you could see in the dark. And so I didn't know it was there until about five minutes after it hit me right across here and knocked me flat on my back and took all the breath out of my lungs. And after about five minutes of going, <gasps> what was that? It was a telephone pole, guide wire, and you lost. And I'm like, obviously. Thankfully, it didn't hit me like two inches higher. And it just reminded me that running in the dark is always a dangerous endeavor. Playing games in the dark is a dangerous endeavor. And Jesus is saying there's nothing to joke around about. He says, I am the light of the world, and I came for those who are in the places of darkness of wickedness, of addiction, of shame, trying to hide, but not doing a very good job of it, filled with guilt and regret. And Jesus is like, I've come to bring you into the light, to bring grace and forgiveness and hope into the world. I've come as a light shining, good news, not just for me and you, but it is for me and you, but it's also for the whole entire world. Good news, a light shining in the dark. Thirdly, what Jesus reveals about us. Jesus reveals about us trying to help us understand ourselves and our lives. He reveals true life is available. That's the promise of John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him doesn't have to perish but have everlasting, what's the word? Life. Life. It's eternal life. We are created to live for eternity with God and it's a fullness of life and it's not just after we die. It's starts right here, right now, starting to live this kind of life. It's the true life that we can live. We're told truth and freedom are found in knowing Jesus. 
Both truth and freedom sort of are together in Jesus. And in John 8, 31 through 32, Jesus says, if you hold to my truth, if you hold to my truth, you are my disciples. Then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Not in the abstract, knowing a bunch of facts and information, but having a life that's been transformed. And as we also said a number of weeks ago in Genesis, this word know, to know the truth, it's not just an intellectual thing, it's a word of intimacy. It's a word of relationship rooted in an understanding. God wants to have a relationship, a loving, intimate relationship with us through Jesus. That's amazing, right? We should never get over that, at least the three of us who think that's amazing. And Jesus is constantly shining a light on what real life can look like and how to have it. And how to have those things that are hidden, those things that are maybe sometimes we're trying to avoid, have them come into the light and, and have forgiveness and grace and hope and peace applied to them. A, a number of years ago, I was on a mission trip to Ecuador and we were flying into the jungles like mud landing strips in the middle of nowhere in a jungle in the rainforest. It was awesome. And so we're coming and we're going to paint some of the buildings that they have built. We're going to play with kids. We're going to teach them songs and Bible stories and tell them about Jesus. But like, it's dark. I don't know if you've ever been to the rainforest in the middle of Ecuador. It's dark. And even when the uh, sun is out, it's a little bit dark. But even if the moon is out at night under the canopy of the trees, it's still really dark. So basically, it's dark everywhere. And we thought, we're working all day or playing with the kids. Like, it's going to be really ha hard to have quality time to have, like, church services at night. So we had a genius idea. Let's bring a generator and lights into the rainforest. And we're like, all right. So we fly on these little planes and land on these mud huts and huck a generator to the worship center and fire it up and turn on the lights. And it was amazing for, like, 15 seconds. And then every bug within five miles came. You couldn't sing a song without getting bugs in your mouth. I was preaching like this, like, Lord, keep these bugs away. Because when the light came on, it was amazing in that it illuminated everything. But when the light came on, it also exposed everything that was hidden up until that point. And one of the beauty beautiful things and yet very terrifying is that Jesus, when he says, I am the light of the world, he's saying, there's so much I want to illuminate. There's healing. There's, there's help that I want to give, but there's also some real authentic exposing that needs to be done in things that have been hidden and stuffed and denied and avoided. And Jesus is like, all of that, all of that, all of that I want to heal. All of that I want to redeem. All of that I want to restore. And I heard this saying recently that God can't heal what we won't reveal. And so it, it calls for getting honest. And when sin is illuminated in our life, and I don't just mean like we know, we're like, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. I mean like it's illuminated like, oh no. I'm sorry for that. We have a choice. What do we do? We can't avoid it. We can deny it. It wasn't my fault. It was their fault. Or we could own it. We could say, God, I'm sorry. And we could find grace and forgiveness. When anxiety or fear is illuminated in our life, and, and we can, whoa, whoa, what do I do with that? Well, we could try to fake it and say, I'm not anxious. I'm just mad. I'm not anxious in a bad way. I'm just, I just care. I just care a lot. I'm not afraid. I'm just really safety conscious. I don't know. But when it's illuminated, what can we do with anxiety or fear and say, I want to give this to God. We're told in scripture, bring me your anxiety. Cast your cares on him because he cares for us. What do we do with it? 
When we find ourselves in a place and uncertainty is illuminated and we're like, man, I don't know what the future holds. I'm so concerned and overwhelmed by like trying to figure out what's ahead. And, and, and we're like living in this world that thinks you have to always have a plan for the next five years or 10 years. And I'm sort of the kind of person right now that I was like, I just wish we could have a plan for the next five months, maybe back it up five weeks, at least five days. Could we just have a plan for five days from now? We live in a world that thinks the, the light of the world is going to be a spotlight. Can I just tell you, 2,000 years ago when Jesus said, I am the light of the world, it was, there was no such thing as lights like we have them. There was no such thing as a spotlight that would shine way ahead and give you the master plan for your life. The only light they had was like this. And that's why Psalm 119 says, God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path. That he will guide us step by step by step. And sometimes we're so, we're so intrigued, we're so even distracted. I just want to know the plan. But we're unwilling to trust with the next step on the path. And you're like, will you just trust me? When, when, uncertainty when doubt is illuminated, we come back to God and we say, help me to trust you here. When anger is illuminated, I mean, I don't know if you've had this happen. Maybe I'm the only one, but like sitting before God and saying, like, God, search my heart. And, and something sort of boils up inside of you. And you're like, where did that come from? I thought that was gone. I thought I dealt with that a long time ago. And God's like, no, I'm still trying to heal that thing. You can trust me with it. Bring it back to me again and bring it back to me again and bring it back to me again and soon with enough repetition, bring it back to me again, we find our hearts being formed to be like his. We, we begin to understand our instinctual response is to go to him, not away from him. See, Jesus shines a light on all kinds of things in our lives. Jesus shines a light on our words. And some of you are like, uh-oh, my words? Uh, I, I don't really want you to know my words. Okay, Jesus shines a light on our pride. Well, that, that's not necessarily seen or understood by others. Jesus shines a light on our motives. Not just what you do, but why you do the things you do. He shines a light on our thoughts, and we're like, no, 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 that's private. Yeah, and he's God. Jesus shines a light on our desires. And when he begins to shine that light, the, the, the response that would get us in alignment with who he is is search me and know my heart. Have your way. We don't ever have to walk in darkness. Walking in darkness is things like hiding shame or failure or denial or blame. And Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world and I'm inviting you into the light. See, but we're fighting in a world that says, well, you know, he is, maybe he's a light, but he's not the light. And you know, yeah, he's the light, but don't let it shine too bright because there's this other question you have to ask. And part of that is, um, what do you want to do? And you got to figure that out and, and make your own way. And Woody was teaching last week, and I think in the 9 o'clock, he said, Burger King is full of heresy. I don't think he said that at 11 o'clock, but he said, the, your way right away, that's like heresy. And I was like, yeah, heresy. But how much of our lives do we're like, what do I want? Well, you just do whatever you want. You just make it up for yourself. That flies in the face of what Jesus is saying. Or maybe we sometimes go with a, a buffet approach. You know one thing I miss being in Southern California? There's just not enough good buffets around here. I used to love, like in the South, a good buffet. And you're like, how much room do I have on this plate? Room for a little bit more. If it didn't go this way, it could start to go this way. And like, you, you know, like when you're like, I've already got like three or four meats, but just one more serving of a meat will do good on this plate. It's a buffet approach. And sometimes we're looking at Jesus and we're like, well, I'm doing a little bit of this and a little bit of this and I'm trying hard and I pray a little and I go to church and a little bit of Jesus and I just want Jesus thrown in with everything else. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. I am the light of the world. There is no other in competition. 
absolute surrender and saying, you are Lord of all or you're not Lord at all. Have your way. Or, or there's a therapeutic approach. Now, let me first say this. I am not against therapy at all. I'm not against counseling at all. But Jesus isn't a therapist. <laughs> and he's not trying to make us feel better about ourselves. That's why if you were paying attention to the verses you read out loud, I didn't read by myself, you read them out loud. Jesus says, if you stay in your sins, you will die in your sins. That's not a very encouraging, but it's an enlightening thing because Jesus then says, and I am the help you need. Jesus is calling us to come to the light so we can see how to truly live. The only other alternative is to reject the light and stay in the dark. It's, the only, it's just one of those two paths. And we're called to believe, we're called to obey, and we're called to surrender. Real quickly, a couple observations. As I was just reading through this and going through this over and over again this week, number one, I just thought about this. The light, Jesus said the light of the world is, for, is not for condemning, but for curing. It's not wanting to condemn us, not wanting us to make us feel miserable or guilty or shameful, but to say, here's the cure. There's a difference between a knife and a scalpel. And the scalpel of the word of God and the truth of God brings healing into our lives. Uh, number, or secondly, observation, the light must be kept close or we lose sight. Back in that day, you had to stay close to the light or you couldn't see clearly. If the light was over here and you started wandering out in the dark, that light didn't help you. So one of the evidences of, of following Jesus was a closeness to the light. 1 John 1, 6 says it this way, if we claim to have fellowship with him, with him, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. We're not living it out. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. And so we're called to be close for each step. It's a day-by-day -day kind of thing. You can't do something 20 years ago that's still lighting your path today. It's a fresh move. It's a fresh work. God is saying, I want you to know me and trust me and follow me today. Also, the light only fulfills its mission in the dark. This light is not even that bright because we're in a room that is filled with lights. But if this room was pitch dark, that light would shine brightly. And the true mission of light is in the dark places. And, and I hear us a lot as, as Christians lament the darkness of our world, but wouldn't seeing the darkness of the world also call us to remember we're the light of the world. Darkness needs light. Uh, I'm going to skip that John 12 passage, sorry, Matthew 5. Uh, you are the light of the world is what Jesus said. Get this, not only in John 8, 12 does Jesus say, I am the light of the world. In a different way, this is what Jesus said. To all of my followers, you are the light of the world. You've got purpose. You, you, you've got responsibility. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That they see your good deeds and say, man, you must be an amazing person. No, they see your good deeds and they're like, how do you have a hope in a moment like this? And you're like, because my hope is not in this world. My hope is found in Jesus. And it is an unshakable hope no matter what happens to me. They're looking at you. They're like, how do you have joy with all the stuff that's going on? Because my joy is not circumstantial. It's not temporary. It is an eternal joy. And God is filling me with something that I couldn't work up on my own. Anybody know what I'm talking about? They could look at us and they could say, how in the world, how in the world do you have peace? You live in California. Because the government doesn't give out peace, Jesus does, and I'm not looking to them. Well, everybody else is so negative. Why are you not negative? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Jesus has changed my life. 
and I have so much to be thankful for. Why would I spend my life complaining when he's treated me with such grace and mercy? I didn't plan on saying any of that. But that's the reality of what happens when Jesus begins to illuminate our life. Lastly, the light must shine in us before the light will ever shine through us. And here's where I want to land. I'm really concerned about us. Because most of us have gotten really good at shining the light on other people. We're like, you know what you need? You need a little light in your life and here you go. Let me help you understand how bad you are. Here, Jesus, shine on them. And Jesus is like, actually, I want to shine on you first. And when we're extending that light and pointing it towards others before we allow it to search our own heart, we're being what's called a hypocrite. We're being what the Bible calls self-righteous. God needs to search our own hearts first. The light starts there. I'm not saying that there's not a time where we're not, hey, can I talk to you? I'm really concerned about you. But only and always only after first the word has searched us. And so... There's some of us here today that, if you're honest, you may say, all this darkness and light stuff is a little bit new to me, but I can tell you I'm all in the dark. And there's not a lot of hope, not a lot of peace, not a lot of joy, not, not a lot of Jesus at all. I'm in the dark, but man, I want the light. And I want the love and grace of God. I want to pray in just a moment for you. Then there's others of us who we would say, I, I, I know I'm in the light, like I've got a relationship with God, but let's just be honest, I've been choosing darkness, 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 and the light may be way over there, but I keep walking further and further away. Maybe today's the day to go back. And here's a prayer for all of us to pray, and then I'll lead us in a moment. Can we put um, Psalm 139 up? I want you to just go slowly through this prayer. Just pray, search me, God, and know my heart. Search me, God, is this like letting God do what he does best, revealing in us what's going on, pointing out to us, helping us to be aware. He doesn't need to be aware. We need to be aware. What are those places where we're hurt? What are those places that he wants to heal? What are those places where there's sin and we can't fix ourselves? We need his forgiveness. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and see my anxious thoughts. It's this invitation that bring those anxieties up. Not, not the superficial reactions, but the, the deep roots that are in our heart that need to be uprooted. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. Maybe we have offended God or we've offended others and maybe we need to go and own that and say either to God, I'm so sorry, or to others, I'm so sorry. Lead me in the way everlasting. Let's be that light in the middle of a dark world. God, I want to follow Jesus step by step. Lead me. If you're a Christian, you, you, you probably know about this kind of passage and this kind of searching, but if you're like here and you're like, I'm not a Christian, I, I, I'm in the dark, I just want to tell you, Jesus' love is for you. His grace is for you. When, when the whole world and all of us in us feels dark, his grace is for us and he wants to bring us into the light. And it just happens as we surrender. We don't have to have it all figured out, but we say, God, I give you my life. God, please forgive me. And Jesus does this amazing work called salvation. And today could be the day. Would you just pray with me? And if there's anybody that you feel like I am overwhelmed, overcome by the darkness, and I just need, I just need the light, would you pray this? Jesus, I need you. You are the light of the world, and I am in darkness. I need you. I give you my life. Please forgive me of all I've done wrong. I believe in you. With our eyes closed real quick, I want to be able to pray, but with our eyes closed in this place, just to make it as private as possible, 
Is there anybody that would just raise your hand and say, Aaron, pray for me. I just prayed that prayer with you. I prayed for the first time, and, and I don't really know what it all means, but I know that something is going on in me. God bless you. Anybody else, you would just raise your hand. Aaron, pray for me. God bless you. 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 God, you, you see... God bless you. Every hand you have, every heart, every person that's saying, we need you, God. We're, we're desperate for you. We're, we're praying that in a moment like this, like we need your help. We can't handle this life on our own. And so we're surrendering to you these burdens, these fears, these anxieties, these sins. And we're saying, God, would you move in a strong way in our lives? Jesus, you're the light of the world. And we want to follow you. We want to have the light of life. So we just commit right now in a new way. We, some of us are right now committing to the, you for the first time. Have your way in our lives. We need you, Jesus. And I pray for your peace, and I pray for your hope, and I pray for your deliverance, and I pray that you would truly illuminate and expose those dark places so that they can find their healing, they can find their restoration, they can find their saving in you, Jesus. You're good. You're faithful, and we trust you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing one more song, just a declaration of who Jesus is, and then our prayer team is going to line the front. If you raised your hand and you said, I prayed that prayer, I, I, I asked Jesus to take over, saying I need you, I'm going to ask you before you leave, just take a couple quick minutes and come pray with one of these on our prayer team. Talk to them for just a minute. This is the most important decision you would ever make whether or not to give your life to Jesus. So don't leave this place without us giving you a prayer, but also some resources. Um, let's stand right now, and we're going to sing, and we're going to declare we need Jesus more than anything.